You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner, one of the most prominent bankers in international banking, has been Edmund J. Safra. He's a subject of a new book called A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Rebuilt a Global Financial Empire. The author is Daniel Gross, one of the most widely read writers on finance, economic, economics, business history. He's written for the New York Times and New Republic and Money Box. And uh, he also shares a similar background to Edmund Safra that both part of the Syrian Jewish community. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And thank you. So, first of all, you're part of the community, but your name is Gross. That's more of an Ashkenazic name. I'm, I'm not the first one to ask you that question. Yeah, so my my father is uh, Gross. He's a nice Ashkenazi guy from the Bronx. Um, he, you know, was an only child. His parents died long before I was born, so we really had sort of no family on that side. And the family I knew growing up was my mother's, and her name is... She was born in Brooklyn in the 30s in the Syrian community. Um, my grandparents each had eight or nine brothers and sisters. Uh, they had names like Nasser and Dweck. Uh, and they lived in Brooklyn and Deal, New Jersey. And I grew up in Michigan, but that was that was the family I knew. That was the family I had. So we grew up, you know, cursing at each other in Arabic and eating rice on Passover and, um, you know, keenly aware of the sort of uniqueness of the, the Syrian Jewish community. It's everything very unique, and they have a very strong presence, especially in places like Brooklyn, New York, Ocean Parkway, and Deal, New Jersey, in the metro New York area. Now, tell us about Edmund J. Safra. He was fluent in many different languages. Um, he built a powerhouse of banking. His name was attached to a bank as well as other financial institutions. But let's look at the beginning. He came from Aleppo in Syria, part of the Syrian Lebanese community, and uh, eventually made his way to Italy and eventually to New York. So, but let's look at who he was and how did he get involved in this world of banking where he became such a powerhouse? Well, he was he was born into it. So he was born in 1932 in Beirut. Um, his father had moved there from Aleppo uh, in 1920, and they were part of a multi-generational banking family, a sort of mini Rothschilds of the Middle East. At a point in the 1870s, there were four Safra brothers. One went to Alexandria, one went to Istanbul, one went to Aleppo, one went to Beirut. Um, at the age of 15, his father, Jacob Safra, sent Edmund to Milan to start trading and look for a beachhead for the family business. At that point, what they had was a small bank in Beirut. Um, Edmund, in the early 50s, at the age of 20, 21, decides, I'm moving the family to Brazil. He moves his father, his younger brothers there. Uh, they start setting up financing operations in Brazil. In 1959, at the age of 27, he opens a Swiss bank in Geneva. In 1964, at the age of 32, he opens Republic Bank in New York as a startup. Uh, Republic grew, up, grew into becoming the 11th largest bank in the U.S. So, you know, he was born into the banking business. He was an heir. He was already, you know, sort of wealthy, certainly in his community. But what he did is went around the world and started banks from scratch with his own money uh, three or four times, and each one of them grew into a very large institution. He lived over the course of his life. He spoke seven languages fluently. He had homes in New York, London, Paris, Geneva, Monaco. Uh, he continued to own his father's bank in Beirut at his death in 1999. So through the civil war, through the Israeli occupation, through the Syrian occupation, their little bank in Beirut, he held on to it and it continued to operate. Um, so he had this, I'm is that sorry. Bank, is the bank still there today? Uh, it was sold. Yes, it was. Yeah, you know, it was after his death. It was sold to some other people. It operates in Beirut. And if you, you know, look at that bank's website, it says this bank was founded by Jacob Safra. You know, in Lebanon, in Beirut, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, uh, where the different sects, including Druze, Muslim, Christian, Jews, Maronite Catholics lived in relative harmony. Obviously, it all went sort of south in the 60s or 70s and 80s. Um, but he grew up in Beirut at this time. There was a, a bit of a golden era where, you know, they were part of the establishment just like everybody else. And it's amazing because with all the tension with Israel and, of course, uh, 
Edmund Saffer was, and the Saffers are big supporters of Israel, so that's what makes it even more unusual that they didn't take it out on the bank in the, in Beirut. Well, one of the interesting things is, um, for the first part of his career, we're talking the 1950s, 1960s, he was quietly supporting charities in Israel. Uh, the tomb of Meir Baal Hanes, um, Porat Yosef, the big yeshiva in the uh, old city overlooking the Western Wall, but he didn't do so directly. Um, in the 50s and 60s, his banks were doing business in Lebanon, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, with a lot of sort of Arab businessmen in Brazil and London. And there were blacklists at the time. If you were doing business with Israel, they would boycott you. Um, so in, the, in for much of his the early part of his career, he didn't invest in Israel. He didn't correspond directly with people in Israel. Um, he was concerned, A, for his banks. He was concerned for the Jewish communities in Beirut and also Aleppo and Damascus, which we was, he was really almost single-handedly helping to support, that if he was too publicly identified with Israel, something bad would happen. And it was only um, in the 1980s that he starts to come to Israel. Um, he, of course, becomes friends with Paris, Rabin. He's, he's supporting a lot of institutions in Israel. And by the time of his death, you know, he had been Israel many times and was, was a sort of constant presence there. But very early in his career, he actually kind of avoided Israel for a bit. But even when he started in the 80s going to Israel, did it affect any of his relationships with the banks in the Arab countries? No. Because I'm sure they knew about it. So that's what I'm... Yeah. It, it seems remarkable. So why do they give him a pass? I'm not sure they gave others such a pass. Do they need him more than he needed them? <laughs> I think it was... I think there's you know, other things going on in the world in sort of Lebanon where to worry about what was going on with this little bank... Um, you know, that was still there. And of course, by the 80s, pretty much all the Jews had left Beirut. Right. But I'm saying there, there could be vindictive in some of these countries or they can. Yes. Right? So that's yeah, but what... ultimately, you know, the, we tell the story in the book in 1994, um, you know, the last three or 4,000 Jews in Syria were essentially being held as hostages by Assad. And in, uh, if you remember after uh, the Gulf War, there was this sort of opening a little where people were starting to talk to Syria. Syria was part of the coalition that pushed uh, um, Saddam out of Kuwait, and they wanted Western money. And Assad was prevailed upon to let the remaining Jews go. Uh, but Assad said, you know, I'm not just going to let people go. You know, we are going to make everybody buy a round-trip plane ticket because I don't want to send the message to my people that you can leave Syria. And uh, Someone called Edmund Saffron on the spot. He bought four thousand round trip plane tickets. Of course, they didn't use the they didn't use the return leg of that, <laughs> and that was essentially the end of the the Jewish, you know, two millennia of Jewish existence in Aleppo and Damascus. Right. It, uh, the final chapter has been written on there, and I know, like you said, they were for a while they were kept captive, and a lot of them ended up coming to New York to to Parkway right. to deal New Jersey, and he was considered one of the leaders of the Jew of the Syrian Jewish community. For sure. So, you know, it's very, I think one of the most interesting aspects to me about working on this book was learning about, uh, because I knew a lot about the Syrian Jewish community, the Jewish community in Lebanon, in Beirut, which is very small, um, but it was, to a large degree, it was Jews from Syria who had sort of moved over the mountains to, um, you know, work and live in Beirut and also Iraqis who had come there. Um, so both in Aleppo and in Beirut, they had a formal, like a community council. There would be a president, there would be a secretary. They had all these different organizations for, you know, Malbiche Alumim was to give people clothes, Go Delay, which meant, uh, you know, taste of milk, was to feed people. There was an organization that would give dowries for and wedding dresses for women who didn't have them. Um, there was a, essentially a informal tax, you know, if you were wealthy, you paid money so you could fund all these things. And when these communities started to break up, you know, after 48, when there were a lot of pogroms and riots in Aleppo, people started fleeing. In Beirut, it came apart more in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. When those community councils broke up, Edmund Safra essentially took it upon himself uh, to be that community council in exile. So I found, you know, I had access to his uh, archive of letters and papers and found all this evidence of, you know, a group of Egyptians who wanted to start a synagogue in Brooklyn in the 60s, they, they came to him and he would guarantee them the money. If they were trying to start a synagogue in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, they would come to him and he would, because, you know, 
the, the community is now very successful financially. But at the time, a lot of them, you know, going back 50, 60 years, these are people who left where they were with essentially nothing. Um, and he, uh, and, it was, and ultimately, as his life went on, it wasn't just for the Syrian and Lebanese, but it was for the Sephardic community writ large. So in the 70s, when they were going to build the first uh, synagogue in Spain since the Inquisition, they went to Edmund Safford, he gave the money, and they named it Beit Yaakov. Yaakov is Jacob, uh, Edmund Safford's father. Um, in the late 70s, when his rabbi from Beirut, uh, Rabbi Atia, finally leaves, he was holding on until the 70s, he comes to Bat Yam in Israel, and Edmund essentially single-handedly pays for the synagogue that he built there for all the Lebanese people. So he really took it upon himself um, as an individual uh, to be the support for these communities. What would you attribute to success? Yes, he came from a banking family, but he had made other banks, including Republic Bank. There's a Safra Bank, which bears his name. What would you say was the secret of his success that he was able to be so successful? Um, I would say it's a few things. You know, one is, and this is, the I think, what's unique about it. <clears throat> there was a mode of banking that they did in Aleppo and Beirut, which was old school, like the oldest of the old school. It was based on your personal honor, right? If I lent you money, you paid it back to me, not because you felt you had to, but it was your family's good name and your family's honor. You only lent and did uh, business with people you knew. And it was a world of trust. If you think about like in a world before the internet, the telephone, why would you lend money? You would only lend money to people that you trust. And the world of trust had to do with sort of families, communities, et cetera. It's like in 40 uh, Street with the Ashkenazim with the diamonds, right? Exactly. That, uh, like, or, you know, how the Rothschilds were doing banking in the, you know, in the 18th and 19th century. And then the second thing is, if you are responsible for deposits, and there is no central bank, there is no deposit insurance, there's no bailouts, it's on you to make good on the deposits that people leave with you, then you are going to have a different attitude towards risk. You are going to hedge your bets whenever possible. You are not going to loan recklessly. You will... Uh, you know, get involved in financing trade, in currency exchange, in gold trading, the sorts of things that, you know, don't leave you exposed to, like, lending someone $50 million for no reason. No, there so he, he, he applied those, those kind of old school lessons that he had learned, you know, at his father's knee as a child. And his genius was to apply that and build those networks on a global scale. Um, so that wherever he went, he was tapping into these networks of, Syrians and Lebanese and other Jewish banking groups, but also every country he went to, and this is part of his genius, he spoke seven languages. He could immediately like fit in with the establishment, not just the Jewish establishment. He went to Brazil. He got to know all the big shots in the banking and publishing world. He went to New York. He was hanging out with David Rockefeller. In Geneva, he knew all the locals there. Um, and so he was Combine that with the sort of a bit ambition to keep building and expanding. He wasn't content just to have one bank or even two banks. So it was this application of the kind of old school lesson, fundamental lessons about managing risk and banking, and then applying that to this kind of global modern canvas that I really that I think kind of made him what he was as a banker. Our guest is Daniel Gross, one of the most widely read writers on finance, econ econ economics, business history. He's written fascinating books, and he's also written for New York Times and other publications. But his new book is called A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. Very impressive. I see you have. And how do you get people like such as Michael Fox and Elton John to give you their endorsement uh, on the book? Um. <clears throat> You know, Edmund Sanford died in 1999. He left behind a uh, foundation that has been, um, over the last 23 years, investing in three very large areas, uh, medical research, especially neuroscience, because Edmund Sanford was stricken with Parkinson's disease in the late 90, 1990s, um, Jewish life and education. Um, so the, you know, Edmund Sanford's a known quantity to someone like Michael J. Fox because of his advocacy on Parkinson's. Uh, yes, we have blurbs from many well-known bankers. These were all people who worked with him and knew him in his lifetime, uh, professionally and socially. And when they were approached about, you know, giving a, a, a little blurb or um, testimony, uh, many of them were, were willing to do so. Now, 
I, I would, from what you said earlier, I would assume he was a conservative banker. He didn't take too many risks, but yep. he had complications along the way, right? American Express. Tell us about some of his complications that he had. <clears throat> well, yeah. So you know, what I've said is a lot of he was relatively a private man. He he didn't go on CNBC. You wouldn't see him at a lot of big dinners speaking publicly. His banks were publicly held. You could buy shares of Republic. Um, you know, they were publicly held from the from almost from the day they were founded. They reported their results uh, every quarter, just like every other bank. But there was a certain amount of, you know, discretion and secrecy that uh, pertained to his life. But what a lot of people do know about him is they know how he was attacked in the 80s by America. But he, I, after I, his life, exactly the, said, who was he attacked in the 1980s? You started saying, yeah. So that this is a chapter. So there's a 500 page book called Vendetta, which is written about this one year in Edmund Safra's life. And in a nutshell, the story is that in uh, the early 80s, Edmund Safra sold one of his banks to American Express. Uh, soon after, they sort of fell out, and so he he leaves, and it's clear he's going to start. He has a five year non compete, so it's clear he's going to start his own private bank, a new one in 1988. And American Express is sort of fearful that you know, all the old clients that were at the previous bank are simply going to leave and go to his new bank. So they try to stop him in the courts in, in Switzerland, but it's unsuccessful. Uh, then one day in the summer of 1988, articles start to appear in the press in Peru, in France, in Switzerland, in Italy, saying things like Edmund Safford's a drug dealer. He's in bed with the Kali and the Medellin cartel. He's involved with Iran-Contra. And Safra uh, initially suspected that somehow American Express was behind this. And people in her circle thought he was crazy because this was a blue chip company, a big name brand company. What would they be doing? Um, there's two things. He starts suing for defamation in these European courts, and he hires private detectives to find out you know, who's spreading this information. Um, and it becomes clear um, in one of the court cases, the lawyers they turn over uh, the, one of the for one of the publications say, "Here, this is where we got the information. This is where we got this dossier about him," and they see that across the top where the fax says that it came from American Express's London office. Secondarily, at the same time, they somehow got the private detectives said there's this sort of low-level mob slash FBI informant was the guy who was spreading this news around, like paying newspapers to publish it. They start following him. The guy lived in Staten Island. They followed him one day. He drives his car to the American Express office and meets someone there for lunch. So effectively, it turned out there were sort of rogue H, uh, you know, PR executives in American Express who were running this smear campaign. And he effectively you know, caught them, confronted uh, the CEO about it. And rather than sue them, said, I want you to issue an apology and I want you to give $8 million in charitable donations to the Red Cross to a hospital in Switzerland, you know, is a sign the, of your contrition. And so that story, like I said, there's an entire 500 page book by a guy named Brian Burrow, who's one of the best business writers of our day. And he wrote it in the early 1990s. And it's just entirely about that year in his life. Wow. So he was right. So American Express was running a rogue operation with F rogue FBI, right? Sounds a little Something like, like that. Yeah. times. Uh, <laughs> But why would a company such as American Express engage in that? Well, uh, I think the you know the the story is that, like I said, they was sort of rogue employees who felt like they were trying to stop him because you know he was going to compete with their bank, and so they were trying to sort of yeah poison the well for his new venture. I don't think it was like a strategy from the highest level. It was these people lower down that sort of took them upon themselves to do it. Now, Evan Saffer, you said, kept a low profile, but didn't he also hobnob have connections with the most intriguing, most powerful people on earth? Indeed he did. Um, you know, again, I had access to his archive. And so there is correspondence with you know, Jacob Rothschild, with the Warburgs, with David Rockefeller. You know, he knew all these people personally. He would go to the White House for state dinners. Uh, he and his wife were active on the sort of social scene and philanthropic worlds in New York. So he wasn't, you know, someone who sat at home all day, 
when I say he was a private person, that he wasn't um, seeking to become a, you know, a household a household name. He didn't go on TV. He didn't do a lot of interviews. Um, he really, but you know, he certainly was on a first name basis with central bankers, prime ministers, people around the world. You know, his banks did a lot of business with. Um, you know, he didn't. He would prefer to lend money to like the Central Bank of the Philippines or the government of South Africa or Brazil because he knew governments would always sort of pay their debts back as opposed to a, a company. Let's look at his religious life. He was observant. Uh, from what I remember, Republic Bank had kosher kitchens. So let's look at his observant lifestyle where he was active in the community, but also was a proud observant Jew. Yeah. So that, you know, people have asked me, is this a business book or is this a Jewish book? You know, they always like to categorize. Why can't it be both? <laughs> um, and in this case, it's 100% both because it was his being. Um, he was born to be a banker, but the type of banking he did and the way he approached it had everything to do with the fact that he was a Halabi, a, a Jew from Aleppo. With their, you know, this community has been existent since the time of the Bible. It was referred to as Aram Tsova, the great synagogue in Aleppo. Cornerstone was laid in the 300s. Very proud, you know, rabbinic dynasties, their own cantillations. Um, but a very proud community with a, and a deep respect for tradition, ritual, rabbis, etc. So Edmund Safra, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people would call it superstitious. But, for example, his license plate and his phone number were always 5555. You know, the symbol... Hamsa. Oh, Hamsa, okay. Uh -huh. Hamsa, which is a symbol of good luck or warding off the evil eye and for both Jews and Muslims in them. So everything, his numbers were all 5555. Five, five, five. He preferred to do deals on a Tuesday. You know why? It's considered a Mazeldic day, a day of Muslim Jewish tradition. Because in Genesis, and on the third day, Hashem says, <laughs> he told. saw that it was good twice. So he preferred to deal do, do deals on a Tuesday. He was selling one of his banks, and it was Monday, January 17th, and it was late at night, and they said, let's sign the papers. And he says, no, we have to wait till 2 a.m. in the morning because I want it to be Tuesday on the 18th. So it's Tuesday, and it was the 18th, and he, he wanted the number he wanted for his bank, he wanted to sell it for $555 million. He got $520 million. He had his suits were, were specially tailored by his, his – uh, Taylor in Milan to have space for certain good luck charms that he carried with him. Um, what kind of good luck? Were they cameos? Were they Sparta? It could be like a, an amulet or a, a, a coin, you know, things from that were important to him. Um, the holiday where people study Torah all night. Shavuot. Shavuot, Shavuot yeah. He would go to the synagogue and be there all night. Um, he was known in the Syrian world um on um, Shabbat, you know, people you bid for the Aliyot. And you bid for the honors on Kol Nidre. And he would send somebody out to all the synagogues in Brooklyn to bid for all the honors in the name of his father and mother, not because he was going to be there, but as a way of sort of making sure they had money, but also to to give the honor to his parents. Um the personal you know, he loved rabbis. If you went to, I, I have a, a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1971 that was written to him. And the occasion was that Edmund Safra had given not one, but two Sifrei Torah to Sha'arei Tzion, which is one of the big Syrian synagogues uh, in Brooklyn. And it was a whole sort of drosh from the Lubavitcher Rebbe on why giving two uh, Sifrei Torahs is such a special mitzvah. Um, so he was a, you know, he, um, he existed fully in the modern world, didn't wear a yarmulke, but was you know, very observant and put on, I, was, I met his personal assistant. She said that he would come in and she would hand him his talis so he could put on tefillin every morning. Um, so this was someone whose, you know, Judaism was based on sort of adherence to ritual, but also being part of this community and um, understanding what it meant to you know, he was very focused on making sure that people had dignity. And for him, dignity was, you know, having a 
first of all, having your assets be protected. So you didn't have to, if you had to flee, you could get your money where you were and having a place to pray and to gather. Um, and so many of the documents I found a correspondence about him sort of, you know, I told you before, sort of supporting synagogues. You know, there's a small synagogue on the island of Rhodes, which is, uh, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea where the community had been wiped out essentially in the Holocaust. He had been there one summer um, and had to say Kaddish, so he went to the synagogue there. And every every year he would send $500 so they could have a chazan for the high holidays. It was very meaningful for him um, not just to participate in services, but to make sure that others had the opportunity to do so. Our guest is Daniel Gross, one of the most widely read writers in finance, he, he, economics, and business history. He's over three decades. He's reported for more than 30 countries, and he's been written up in the New York Republic and New York Times and Bloomberg News. He's written best-selling books. His latest one is called A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. He was controversial in life, controversial in death. Let's look at Friday, December 3rd, 1999 at 7 a.m. What happened? <clears throat> so in the late night, Edmund Safra was in his 60s, had been stricken with Parkinson's disease and was affecting his mobility. At the time, he was living in Monaco on the top of a uh, you know, sort of a two-story apartment on the top of a building in, in downtown Monaco. And he had a villa in the hills about a half hour away. He had round-the-clock nurse, in fact, multiple, you know, a whole sort of team of nurses. One of his nurses was a, an American man who had been a former military, who was you know, mentally unstable and was insecure about his place in the household and his employment, and got it into his mind that he would prove his worth by staging an attack on the apartment and fending off the intruder and saving the day, and therefore... You know, everyone would think he was wonderful and that would guarantee his place. So this guy at you know, four in the morning stabs himself with a knife, sandpapers his face, yells to everybody in the apartment that there is a fire, uh, that there's an intruder, and he sets a fire in a, in a wastebasket to sort of set off the alarm so that the you know, fire and police will come. Goes downstairs, leaves the building, says there's an intruder. Um, and while doing so, you know, tells... Edmund Safra with one of his other nurses, you know, go into this sort of room and wait for the rescuers to come. Um, <clears throat> at the time, you know, Edmund Safra at his villa, he had this, you know, fabulous sort of villa spread over many acres, and there was always a large contingent of security, many of them former Israeli Mossad and, and IDF. But the building where he lived was so secure that they, you know, had alarms and electronic gates and all that that they didn't need a security guard inside. Um, and a it's a series of sort of mistakes and tragedies come. The Monaco police are not used to such things. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't figure out how to get into the building. The Israeli security guards come flying down from the, the, the villa in the hills, and the Monaco police, instead of letting them into the building, arrest them, put them in handcuffs. They can't figure out how to open the shutters from the outside because they are electrically, you know, locked. Meanwhile, they are calling Edmund Safran, telling him to come out. It's okay. And he says, no, there are intruders in the building. I'm not coming out of this room. Um, and eventually that, that fire that the guy had set to alert the first responders, you know, the smoke gets picked up by the circulation and is circulated throughout the apartment. And um, so after a couple hours of them not being able to really get into the apartment, uh, he dies. Uh, he and the nurse both die of asphyxiation. It's a crazy story. Is it's there, a crazy story. And there are a lot of, you know, as with many like things like attached to his life. Right. That's a conspiracy theory surrounding it. Uh, Dominic Dunn wrote an article in Vanity Fair about it. The man who set the fire. Um, you know, I've written, I've read all the testimony. He confessed to this. There was a trial. There was an appeal. This was proven in the court of law. There was no intruder. There is no evidence of any third party in there. There's no evidence that anybody other than this person did exactly what he said he did. Um, and yet, because of, uh, you know, because he was a wealthy man, because 
he was, you know, he was a Lebanese guy from Brazil, but in Switzerland, there was always a certain level of sort of suspicion that attached to him simply because of, you know, where he came from and his accent and the type of person that he was. Now, his wife, Lily, is a powerhouse in her own right. Uh, she just recently passed away, from what I recall, but she herself uh, made headlines and uh, got herself into spats with different parts of the community, right? That's uh, fights with synagogues and control of who's going to be in charge. Um, so she herself is maybe the, the deserving of a book, too. Certainly very common. So they met, you know, they, they didn't get married. They got married in 1976 when they were both in their 40s. Uh, Lily, she was also from Brazil, had been married and had a couple of children and was, you know, when they met, first met in the late sixties, she was probably wealthier than he was. Um, her husband had been uh, a founder of a very large appliance chain in Brazil and, and died in the late sixties, leaving her with a substantial fortune. Um, she had a sort of uh, taste for fine art, um, real estate. So Edmund Safra was, you know, a collector in his own right. He would collect like watches and furniture, but she was into art collecting and they have, you know, one of the sort of most fabulous private art collections. She sort of brought him more into the world of society and philanthropy. Um, and they were sort of partners in some ways. Uh, one of the big things that Republic did every year at the IMF and World Bank annual meetings Republic Bank would throw a, they would take over like the Smithsonian or one of the big art galleries in Washington and have a reception for 3,000 people where senators and prime ministers and all their clients would come. And she planned that like to every detail. After his death, um, he left most of his assets to a foundation called the Ed and J. Safra Foundation, which she, she essentially, you know, helped run for the last 23 years. And I think the thing about, you will see Edmund Safra's name on things all over the world now. But in his lifetime, and the way you know Syrians are, you would never name something after yourself while you're living. You give money, it's in the name of your mother or your father. And so there was, you know, in his lifetime, if he gave for a synagogue, Beit Yaakov, Kol Yaakov, Ohel Yaakov, Safra Square, etc. In the year, you know, he did not have his own biological children to name things after him when he was gone. But the foundation, in the 23 years since he has died, so it has given money for, you know, in Israel alone, there are 12 Edmund Safra synagogues. They just laid the, um, had a groundbreaking last week for a new children's hospital um, in uh, Israel. And so you look around the sort of both the Jewish world, but also at NYU, at the National Institutes of Health, you will find things that are, you know, with the name Edmund Safra on them. And that has been, you know, her doing. That's what she spent the last 20 years of her life doing. Who's running things now? Now that she's gone, there's a it's, you know it's a professional staff of um, executives who run the who run the foundation and run its investments. It's based in Geneva. Now, would you say that she also liked the limelight more than Edmund did? <laughs> well, there's the limelight in the different ways. I mean, he liked being, you know, around his clients and expanding the. He like loved to campaign to get new clients, like even. At the, when he was running banks that had fifty billion dollars in assets, he introduced to someone at a party. He would try to get their business. Um, so he liked the the sort of limelight in his world. I think she brought him more into, um, you know, we might say high society, the Metropolitan Opera, the, those sorts sorts of environments. But she also, I think, was a little more confrontational than he was. She got engaged in some public fights and leadership of some synagogue that she wanted to have the rabbi removed. And she she made news in her own right. So she, in, in certain ways, was more a lot more controversial than he was. Well, I think, you know, sometimes what's controversial about something is the fact that it might be a woman that has the power and the money rather than a man. She certainly had the power and the money. I want to thank you for joining us. What's your next book going to be about? Uh, to be determined. I'm still, I'm still, uh, you know, I finished this one last year, but we're spending a lot of time still, uh, promoting it and talking about it to different groups. And so for, you know, for the moment I'm focused on this one. If the book is made into a movie, who would you like to see portray Edmund J. Safra? Which movie after? That's, that's a question I haven't been asked. I had to come up with something unique and different, yeah. right? <laughs> hold, hold it up to the screen. Maybe Ed Harris, you know, Ed Harris. Okay.
All right. I'm just, because this has potential. It's a great story. Money has power. It's uh, influence. So certainly there and uh, he hobbed out with some of the top names. So may I recommend the book, uh, Daniel Gross's book is called A Banker's Journey, How Edmund J. Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast, the pulse beat of the Jewish community. For continuous Jewish programs, talklinenetwork.com or our 24-hour-a-day listen line at 641-741-0389. For past shows, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Instagram, and all major podcast platforms or jewishpodcast.org. Thanks for listening to the talklinenetwork.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.